Welcome to iFormRx, where we explore the evidence that informs ambulatory care pharmacy practice. During this vidcast, we'll be reviewing the FLARE study, which was published in the British Medical Journal in November 2019. Our reviewer today is Abby Klutz, who is a PGY2 ambulatory care pharmacy practice resident at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. And joining her are our expert panelists, Dr. Diana Isaacs and Dr. Joey Mattingly. Thank you for the introduction, Stuart. I'm glad to be here today to discuss the FLARE study. But first, I'd like to get us all on the same page about home glucose monitoring methods. For decades, we have relied on glucometer readings to inform treatment decisions, but they have several limitations. Patients often forget to record or bring their glucose readings to visits. The readings don't reflect blood glucose trends, and finger sticks can be painful or inconvenient for users. Continuous glucose monitoring, also known as CGM, attempts to overcome some of these limitations. Guidelines aim to improve recommendations for CGM use. According to this year's ADA Standards of Medical Care and Diabetes, you'll see that devices are recommended for patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes using insulin who are not meeting glycemic goals or who experience hypoglycemia. CGM is also recommended in adolescents and pregnant women with type 1 diabetes to improve glycemic control or neonatal outcomes. Typically, traditional glucose monitoring is still recommended during times when the user believes the CGM is inaccurate. For example, if they experience signs or symptoms of hypoglycemia, but their CGM reading is normal glycemic. This diagram shows us the two main types of CGM devices, including real-time and intermittently scanned or flash monitoring devices. In contrast to traditional glucometers, all CGM devices measure glucose in the interstitial fluid, which correlates with blood glucose levels. Otherwise, the real-time devices vary in many ways, including whether they are designed to coordinate with insulin pump use. The FLARE trial utilizes a flash glucose monitor, which differs from real-time devices in a few important ways. A flash glucose monitor must be scanned by the user in order to display results, while real-time monitors automatically transmit data to a receiver. When the flash glucose sensor is scanned, the user can view their current reading and the stored data is downloaded so patients can retrospectively review their glucose data over the previous several hours. Unlike real-time devices, the flash device cannot alert patients about out-of-range results in the moment. However, retrospective review should indicate whether action should be taken to prevent future out-of-range results. Although the life of a sensor varies by device, both types of CGM require that the sensors are replaced at regularly scheduled intervals. Flare NL is a flash monitor registry in the Netherlands. The registry was established to explore the impact of flash glucose monitoring on patient care. The study utilized registry data to assess the effects of FGM on clinically relevant endpoints related to glycemic control, disease burden, and health-related quality of life. The FLARE study was a prospective observational cohort study conducted over the course of one year. Study participants were at least 18 years old with any type of diabetes diagnosis and using insulin. They were treated by a hospital-based diabetes team in the Netherlands. Aside from these inclusion criteria, the participants needed to belong to at least one target group listed on the slide. The first three in red align with ADA recommended groups not meeting glycemic targets. Other target groups in pink were related to occupation. The study provides examples of a musician with sensation loss in fingertips due to frequent testing, or a bus driver with serious implications if a hypoglycemic event should occur while driving. A person could already have been eligible for FGM based on insurance criteria, may already be using FGM with out-of-pocket costs, or fit into more than one of the seven other specified groups. The primary outcome was change in A1C after 6 and 12 months of FGM use. For secondary outcomes, the authors evaluated frequency and severity of hypoglycemia over the previous 6 months. 
Disease burden also included diabetes-related hospitalizations within the previous year and work absenteeism and daily functioning over the previous six months. Finally, health-related quality of life was assessed using three separate questionnaires, which we'll review next. First, the Short Form 12 Version 2 Health Survey is a 12-item abridged version of the more well-known 36-item questionnaire that is used to assess general health outcomes from the patient's perspective. I provided some examples on the slide, including how the respondent would rate his health, whether he's limited in activities, and whether work or daily activities have been impacted by physical health over the last month. Questions relate to eight domains of health outcomes, including physical and mental health, among others. The EuroQual 5D3L includes two components, the first of which comprises questions related to mobility, self-care, usual activities, pain and discomfort, and anxiety and depression. The respondent is asked to check the box most closely indicative of his or her health state related to these five domains. The second part, pictured at right, is a visual analog scale serving as a quantitative measure of health as perceived by the individual respondent. 100 represents the best health the respondent can imagine and zero is the worst. You can find complete editions of the SF12 version two and the EQ5D3L if you follow the links in the website commentary. The final questionnaire was developed based on contributions from a patient panel belonging to DVN, which is the Diabetes Association of the Netherlands with around 40,000 members. The questionnaire includes patient reported outcome measures or PROMs used to detect quality of life related to diabetes specifically, as opposed to more general health related quality of life. Some example survey questions are listed, which were either included for pre-post assessment, while others were descriptive, relating more specifically to using the flash monitoring device. The survey asked participants to rate on a five-point scale how big an obstacle it is to test blood glucose in the presence of strangers, how difficult it is to do what's best based on the result, and to rate their frequency of testing before driving. It also asked how well the new device helps the user better understand glucose fluctuations, make insulin changes based on results, and whether their housemates are more or less worried about their glucose while using the device. You can find the full list of questions in Supplement 1 of the study. About 93% of recruited sites responded to a mailed letter to participate. Each site was responsible for collecting required data, like A1C and other baseline characteristics. About 82% of recruited participants accepted. Reasons for dropout prior to the study included technical difficulties related to online registration. It's definitely possible that the study inadvertently selected for more technologically advanced patients at baseline. The participants were responsible for completing online quality of life questionnaires at baseline. And after six and 12 months, participants filled out the questionnaires again and also reported changes in disease burden. Given the nature of the study, there was no way to enforce follow-up. For baseline characteristics, most patients had type 1 diabetes at 77.2% of participants, followed by type 2 diabetes at 16.3%. The mean age for all participants was about 46 years. You'll see the participants with type 2 diabetes were on average about 17 years older than those with type 1. Remember that insulin use was a requirement for study inclusion, but only about 40% of type 2 participants used insulin as monotherapy. The groups were about half and half male-female, the presence of microvascular complications was similar across groups, and the presence of cardiovascular disease was the lowest in the type 1 diabetes group. There are no major concerns with regard to baseline characteristics being reflective of expected real-world data. Most participants were included for reasons related to glycemic control versus quality of life, but nearly 21% of participants fit into two or more of the target groups previously mentioned. For most diabetes types, A1C had a greater drop during the first six months compared to the last six months. This seems expected since the novelty of the device may wear off over time as participants become more familiar with the device and less interested in keeping such a careful eye on glucose trends. You'll see in Table 3 of the study that trends align with estimated values according to the linear mixed model. When breaking down 12-month A1C reduction by target group, the authors found significant results only for those enrolled for unexpected hypoglycemia, uncontrolled A1C at baseline, and those with multiple indications. 
It's possible that unexpected hypoglycemia was a result of overcorrection of high glucose readings, leading to large fluctuations in glucose. With the introduction of FGM, perhaps they were more able to control A1C within range. It makes sense that those with uncontrolled A1C at baseline had more room for A1C lowering upon introduction of the flash device. Of note, not all participants were evaluated at month 12. Only 6.3% of participants reported reasons for discontinuing the flash device. In order of decreasing prevalence, they included high cost, insufficient convenience, inability to control blood glucose concentrations, a combination of these factors, and other reasons which were not specified. Upon comparing baseline results in dark orange to findings at month 12, the study documents statistically significant reductions in the percentage of reported hypoglycemic events, diabetes-related hospital admissions, and work absenteeism. Compared to baseline, the SF12 mental but not physical component and both EQ scores achieved statistically significant improvements in quality of life with p-values less than 0.05. All 12-month observed scores were equal to or greater than what was estimated using the linear mixed model. The SF12 mental component score increased by 3.3 compared to baseline. Estimates vary, but one study suggests a change of 3 points or higher might indicate a clinically significant change. The EQ score increased by 0.03. One systematic review estimates that a clinically significant change on the EQ questionnaire would be about 0.03 or higher. The visual analog scale increased by 4.4 .4 on the 100-point scale. Based on results from the DVN PROM assessment, the authors report improvements in various areas related to glucose monitoring. Participants reported feeling more comfortable monitoring around strangers. They felt and improved their decision-making strategies and increased their monitoring prior to driving. They reported better understanding fluctuations and more participants changed their insulin dose as a result of their readings. Additionally, housemates seem to worry less about glucose readings while using flash monitoring. I'm so grateful to have insight from two expert panelists today. First, we have Dr. Joey Mattingly, who is an Associate Professor of Pharmaceutical Health Services Research at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. We also have with us Dr. Diana Isaacs, who is a clinical pharmacy specialist in endocrinology and CGM program coordinator at the Cleveland Clinic. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much. It's really great to be here. Joey, let's start with you. In your view, what are the key strengths and limitations of the FLARE study? One of the things that I like the most about this study is that it is a pretty large sample size and it's using registry data, which is really good because we're talking about real world data, real world evidence. Uh, this is a, as opposed to, say, a randomized controlled trial or a clinical trial where um, patients may be a little bit more restricted and limited. So in terms of weaknesses, I think one of the challenges is that there's no real control group. It's actually as you're following this registry of patients, they use the baseline six month and 12 months. So you're using basically each individual serves as his or her own control. And I think that creates some limitations when doing observational research. Diana, do you have anything to add with regard to strengths and limitations? I'd just also like to add, you know, I think it's definitely a diverse population, included people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes and even other forms of diabetes. I think on the side of CGM, I would have just liked to see a little bit more information. So with they use the flash CGM or the Freestyle Libre. And one of the things with that specific type of device is it can only remember up to eight hours of information at a time. So if a person, let's say, is only scanning, you know, scanning less than every eight hours, they're going to get less information. And so it just would be really useful to know how many times a day the person was scanning, as well as what kind of interventions there were in terms of how often they were meeting with the healthcare team, what kind of training they got and what the numbers and the information mean. So I really would have liked to see that type of information. Another limitation to the study that I did just want to mention was that the patients actually had to pay for half of the device themselves. So one of the concerns is in terms of the type of people using it, they may have you know, had more money or they were a little bit more invested in their care because they were willing to pay this component to be able to use that device. So just in thinking about the generalizability to, to everyone else, that's something to take into consideration. 
The gold standard for conducting clinical trials is the consort guidelines. For systematic reviews and meta-analyses, we use the PRISMA guidelines. Joey, is there a comparable gold standard process for conducting health-related quality of life studies? And if so, did the authors adhere to those guidelines? One thing I would like to kind of point out with consort guidelines and PRISMA guidelines uh, as well, all of these are actually reporting guidelines. So the challenge that we sometimes have is that um, as we conduct a study, there's really not always a best practice to do one thing. Uh, but, but what we've all agreed to is, well, whatever you do, you should all be consistent in how you report what you did. And so with this, rather than, you know, thinking of it as a health related quality of life study, we, we maybe back up a second and think, okay, this is an observational study. This is a study of patients in a in a registry. And so for observational research, we would use the strobe guidelines. So this would be the strengthening the reporting of observational studies in epidemiology. And so thinking about that guidance, um, while the authors did not cite strobe and it doesn't appear that they, you know, thought of going along that path and, and checking those boxes, uh, the similar checklist that you'd see in Prisma or Consort, I would say that the authors did a pretty good job adhering to the guidelines. They address in their limitations some of the bias uh, that, that they may have inserted or, you know, how do they try to address that bias. Um, another thing to think about is for quality of life uh, instruments or preference-based instruments that similar to what they used, um, there are task force that, that certain groups put together and give recommendations on best practices in, in this field. And task force that I like to think about is from the uh, International Society for Pharmacoeconomics and Outcomes Research, or ISPOR. They actually had a task force that, that put together some best practices on how to implement these questionnaires into um, further economic analyses, because often that's what the purpose for these uh, preference-based measures are, to not only report out a quality of life score, but then to translate that into how that might be used in a cost-effectiveness analysis. Now, Diana, I'm curious whether you agree with the authors that the use of CGM could improve quality of life. Alternatively, are there ways in which you think that CGM could negatively impact quality of life? So yes, I very much agree that CGM improves quality of life and not even so much just based on the study, but I, it's something that I help uh, people with diabetes use every single day and get started on. And so I see it firsthand, people coming back and saying, wow, this really, this was really impactful. This is amazing. I learned so much about how the foods I'm eating are affecting me, or I learned more about, you know, how I should be dosing my insulin. So I, I see it and I know it's true. Um, in terms of, you know, the second part, are there ways in which people, you know, could negatively, it could negatively impact quality of life? There are some people that don't do as well with CGM. I would say it's a very small subset, but some people don't like having all of the numbers, all of that data, find it to be a little bit overwhelming, um, can induce some anxiety. And I think even in this trial, we saw that some people discontinued it. Now, Diana, it definitely seems you agree that CGM can improve quality of life. Do you think that improving quality of life alone is a compelling enough reason to use CGM? And I'm also curious if you think that quality of life data could be used to support the use of one type of device over another. Yes, I, I think quality of life is very, very important. I mean, even something, you know, people complain all the time about having to poke their fingers and how inconvenient it is. It's painful. You know, it can be embarrassing having to do that in front of a lot of other people. And I think there's a lot of diabetes distress and other anxiety and depression have been associated with diabetes. So, you know, you can't, anything you can do to improve a person's quality of life is very, very important. Um, in terms of, you know, is that enough of a reason to choose one device over another? So unfortunately, you know, a lot of it does come down to cost. If it was a million dollars, would a few points, you know, improvement in quality of life be worth it? One of the great things is now, you know, especially the technology is disposable, transmitters, and the cost is really coming down a lot. So I think, you know, hands down, if we can make the cost um, where it's not too costly, then yeah, um, that improvement in quality of life is, is really important. Now, moving back to Joey, I'm curious to learn more about these two general health-related quality of life instruments, the first being the SF12 version 2 and the other being the Euroqual 5D3L. What can you tell us about these instruments? First, are they validated for this purpose, and how widely are they used, and are they useful to guide clinical decision-making? Yeah, great question. So when we think about 
health-related quality of life, there's different ways to assess that. These general instruments are the, the way that they describe more of a generic instrument that ask questions like, um, in general, would you say your health is one, excellent, two, very good, three, good, you know, and, and so on. And maybe a question will say something like, um, are your activities limited? Yes, no, or not at all, or, or, or some, somewhat. And these are very g- general, and as you can imagine, um, can be used across a lot of different disease states. So to say, are they validated? They certainly are validated to use in the population. But think about what, I guess, what you're wanting to get at. So if we're trying to say, does continuous blood glucose monitoring have a major impact on overall quality of life, you know, would it truly have an impact on whether or not someone can climb several flights of stairs? Uh, you know, that, that may be the challenge is that, is that, okay, does this general health related quality of life instrument, is it going to just, you know, are you going to see a difference between with and without, you know, this new, uh, you know, using a new technology? Thinking about is it is it fit for purpose? One of the interesting things, that, you know, when I first read this study, I, I was like, oh, of course they were going to use the EQ5D because this is in the Netherlands. Often uh, in many of the European countries, many countries around the world, their healthcare systems actually require for new technologies to be covered under a single payer government system. They may have what's called a health technology assessment body or agency that will actually do, you know, use a health economics framework to estimate whether or not the cost for that quality of life uh, benefit, is it actually cost effective and, and at, a, at a point where they're willing to pay for it for their for their population. So that's sort of why, you know, as I'm thinking about this, um, these instruments that they use, they certainly are widely used. They're used for decision making, um, certainly at the government level across um, the world. Not That is not the case in the United States. So actually, I really appreciate that the authors uh, went forward with a disease specific quality of life questionnaire. This is this is very common in a lot of diseases where just because I've made something more convenient on a regular basis for my diabetes care, maybe it's not going to have a big impact on on something like mobility. It may not impact their pain or discomfort level or their anxiety or depression level. So as you can imagine that 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 instrument itself might be limited in, in seeing any differences when, when the patient goes from um, you know, standard methods to CGM. I'm interested to kick it back to Diana for some more information on using the devices. So as I previously mentioned in the vidcast, the 2020 ADA guidelines suggest that uh, CGM should be considered in certain patient populations. Now, Diana, do the results of this paper expand the patient populations who might benefit from CGM, or does it merely affirm what we already know? So I'd love to say that these results are groundbreaking and now expand it for everyone, but I don't know that we can say that based on this one study. What I did like about the study is that there included more people with type 2 diabetes and showed a pretty nice A1C reduction of about 0.6%. So I would say it does make a stronger case for use in insulin-treated people with type 2 diabetes. Despite all the positive considerations for CGM use, there has been concerns raised about misleading results, giving patients and clinicians a false sense of security. So what can you tell us about the accuracy of CGM devices, and are there particular circumstances when the results should be evaluated with a more skeptical eye? So that is really a great question. So the CGM technology has improved a ton. Um, there's something called MARD, uh, mean absolute relative difference. And it's really thought that once you get MARD below 10%, that, you know, devices are comparable and they're, they're very accurate. And so the current devices on the market meet that threshold. One of the interesting things when we think about CGM compared to, you know, we think of the gold standard as finger sticks, but actually blood glucose meters are very far from perfect. There was actually, I love this. There was a study 10 healthy people without diabetes. And, you know, they had them check their glucose with peeling an orange and peeling a grape and um, other fruit and showed that it could be altered and and show a glucose in the 300s. And then once a person would use one alcohol swab, it would actually go down to like the 200s or the high 100s. And then when a person properly washed their hands all the way, it came back down to normal. So thinking about that, I know my patients are not always 100% cleaning their hands perfectly all the time. 
On top of that, you can have other errors like squeezing too much. It, there's so many things that could go wrong that, you know, really no data is perfect. So I think we, we have to understand is any time a person's symptoms don't match what the glucose level is saying on a device, that's when it's really important to get another glucose reading to use a, to do a finger stick with a meter and to confirm that, especially in the first 12 hours of use of the device, that's when the results tend to maybe not be as accurate. So these are all the very important educational points that hopefully the person who's getting a new device is meeting with their pharmacist or diabetes care and education specialist to go through all this so that they have the most success with it. I'd like to again thank Joey Mattingly and Diana Isaacs for sharing their expertise. We reviewed guideline recommendations, noted key differences between devices, and discussed select results from the FLARE study. To apply the discussion to clinical practice, we'll first need to consider when to recommend CGM. Key populations who could benefit include patients with poor glycemic control, those who cannot adhere to traditional finger sticks, or those who would benefit from CGM as an educational tool to understand how lifestyle choices and insulin dosing impact glucose results. A device with alarms could be crucial for those with hypoglycemic risk, especially in the case of hypoglycemia unawareness. If a flash monitor is selected, patients must be able to adhere to frequent device scanning throughout the day, ideally every eight hours. Cost is always a consideration, but as technology advances and devices become more affordable, I'm excited to see how routine CGM use will continue to grow and impact health outcomes. Thank you for watching this vidcast brought to you by iFormerX.org, where we explore the evidence that informs ambulatory care pharmacy practice. If you are a board certified ambulatory care pharmacist, you should check out the board recertification program offered by the American Pharmacists Association. We've partnered with APHA to make iFormerX commentaries, podcasts, and vidcasts available for board recertification and continuing education credit. To learn more about APHA's ambulatory care board prep and recertification program, click on the link below.